And good afternoon, everyone. This is Diane Fodell. Thank you for joining the Cognitive Systems Institute Speaker Series. This morning, I am excited to introduce our presenters for today. First, Eric Manser is a part of the IBM research team that ensures accessible IBM solutions, new approaches to accessible technology, and contributes actively to worldwide accessibility standards. Eric is an avid marathon runner and triathlete, and in this year's Boston Marathon, he tested a new technology which may one day provide remote sighted assistance to blind and visually impaired runners. Uh, this received broad media attention, including Time Magazine and Popular Science. Will Scott is a software architect in IBM Research working with the Accessibility Technology and Innovation Team. His area of focus is developing solutions related to cognitive computing. Will received his PhD in engineering science from Louisiana State University with a research focus in machine learning and neural computing. Having spent over a decade in IBM product development prior to moving into his role in research, Will draws from cross-domain knowledge in cloud, mobile, and web-based technologies when designing solutions. Help me welcome Will and Eric, and I will turn the call over to them who will talk to us today about self-driving accessibility. Take it away, Eric. Awesome. Thank you very much, Diane. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Eric Manser. I am, as Diane mentioned, part of IBM Research. Uh, I also happen to be someone uh, who has been losing my eyesight slowly over many, many years. Uh, I was diagnosed at, an eight, at age five uh, with a degenerative eye disease called retinitis pigmentosa. And so, you know, I've been experiencing over time kind of a gradual loss of, of vision uh, you know, I describe basically how I see, if, if you can picture looking through a drinking straw uh, that you cover with wax paper, so kind of a small circle of, you know, really just straight ahead view <laughs> uh, that, that's kind of hazy. Uh, and, you know, so my path to, my gradual path to blindness uh, has, as you might imagine, given me a firsthand appreciation uh, for the importance of accessible technology. And as we work in technology in our day-to-day -day lives, um, you know, and, and technology continues to emerge and evolve, and, uh, you know, the, the importance of making sure that the technology that we're working on can be used by everyone, right? And that's regardless of any sort of a disability or just naturally aging, uh, you know, age-related impairments uh, are very significant. So, um, you know, if, if I think about my own scenario, I consider myself to be kind of an extreme example uh, of disability, whereas someone who, you know, maybe like a baby boomer or someone who's just naturally aging who has now been using, you know, various technologies for a number of years and they're experiencing changes in how their ability to, uh, to use it. So um, if you see on the first slide here, what we're looking at, uh, that friendly looking vehicle uh, is called Ollie. Uh, O-L-L-I, and Ollie is a 3D printed 12-person uh, shuttle van, and uh, it's it, there's a, an interesting story behind Ollie because uh, IBM earlier this year became involved in a partnership uh, where we've made a very bold claim that uh, we would like to work with Local Motors, who is the company, they're based in Arizona, uh, who uh, is behind Ollie. They print a number of different 3D vehicles, but Ollie uh, is one of the vehicles that they produce. And, you know, working together with Local Motors and with CTA Foundation, which is the organization that puts on the Consumer Electronics Show every January in Las Vegas, uh, working as a collaborative effort, uh, we have agreed uh, to make Ollie the most accessible self driving autonomous vehicle that there is. Uh, so it's a very bold claim. And what we uh, have stated uh, we will do is return to CES next year uh, with some really compelling use, use case examples showing how, uh, you know, Ollie can be the most inclusive and uh, accessible self-driving vehicle. So here are some important factors on this second slide. You know, a little background on the importance of, you know, making sure that, that uh, you know, self-driving vehicles can be uh, can be made in an accessible way. Uh, if we look at the numbers, over 1 billion people or 15% of the world's population experience some form of disability. Uh, that's according to the World Health Organization. Uh, according to the UN, uh, the number of people aged 60 years or older is projected to grow by 56% worldwide by 2030. 
uh, 1.6 billion, 23% of the world's population is over age 50. So, you know, there's definite need uh, in in terms of from an aging perspective. Uh, the world obviously is uh, experiencing an explosion uh, in connected devices and cognitive computing capabilities. Uh, and it's estimated, you know, with self-driving technology emerging and evolving, uh, the estimates are uh, that we'll see more than 10 million self-driving vehicles on the roads by the year 2020, uh, which is not very far off at all. So, <laughs> uh, you know, just a little bit of context. And next slide here. Again, uh, project, as I alluded to, uh, is a collaboration. It's a partnership between those three organizations, Local Motors, IBM, uh, and CTA Foundation. Um, the partnership uh, is already leveraging IBM's Watson capabilities. Uh, the 3D printed Ollie vehicles that Local Motors is producing today already include Watson uh, kind of in, you know embedded in the technology. So when they pr produce an Ollie vehicle, it already has Watson on board. Uh, so you know a huge part of what our uh, effort will include will be to tap into the you know the API that Watson includes, whether it's text to speech capabilities or computer vision capabilities, you know really kind of leverage the capabilities that Watson has baked right in uh, in our efforts to create this very accessible self driving vehicle. Um, some really important points from this slide creating the most accessible vehicle. Um, you know, will serve a lot of wonderful uh, purposes, including allowing older adults to age in place uh, rather than, you know, needing to move to an assisted living community uh, and retain independence. And, you know, oftentimes it's a, it's a very struggle, you know, a very challenging situation when uh, someone who is uh, getting older uh, has to give up their driver's license and give up their, you know, basically from their, you know, from their perspective, their autonomy and their ability to uh, remain productive and, and active in, in community and life. So, uh, you know, the ability to create, uh, you know, a highly accessible vehicle will, will meet many needs within our society, uh, as well as, you know, really serve to help, um, uh, I guess, minimize uh, the, uh, the challenges of, you know, I guess society at large moving over to the driverless cars. You know, there are a lot of questions, uh, you know, as, as the technology is developing and, and being rolled out. You know, you hear from people all the time that, you know, there's uncertainty. I mean, the, the, con the, the prospect of getting into a vehicle where there's no one <laughs> sitting at a steering wheel, the steering wheel, uh, can, can be daunting or unsettling to people. So, you know, that's a, sort of another bonus of this project is, is kind of with a gradual rollout of, uh, of the self-driving technology in an accessible way. Uh, it'll help minimize some of the perceived uh, uncertainty or, or discomfort with the uh, self-driving vehicle. Okay. Uh, so our strategy actually in this partnership, since it was announced in January, uh, we've taken, you know, a somewhat aggressive approach. I mean, we do have, you know, we, at the time of the announcement, we had a year uh, to put some things in place to demonstrate how Ollie can be an accessible self-driving vehicle. And so, you know, at that time it was one year, uh, and a year is not much, especially when you're targeting some bold innovations and, and some, uh, you know, dramatic changes and uh, leveraging some of the exciting new things. So our strategy has included kind of in the early stages uh, a series of workshops uh, and hackathons that, you know, have allowed us to really talk to the communities uh, and gain first, you know, firsthand user feedback on, you know, what is an accessible vehicle? You know, what does that look like? And what kind of user needs are out there that we want to be sure to address and include as we work to make Ollie an accessible vehicle. And so, you know, some examples of the workshops that we, we held, uh, there was an interesting one uh, in February that we had down in uh, National Harbor, down in the D.C. area, uh, actually just outside Maryland. Uh, it was a, a partnership that IBM has with P-TECH schools, uh, which is, a, an, you know, engineering or, or STEM 
uh, oriented program uh, in the school. So we met with a lot of young uh, aspiring engineers, uh, held a workshop. It was a wonderful kind of collaborative brainstorming session. Uh, from there, uh, actually in the same kind of uh, time frame, we also met with AARP, uh, the American Association of Retired Persons, um, at their hatchery, which is a, a remarkable facility right in D.C. Uh, and so, you know, kind of contrasting, we, uh, you know, started the the uh, trip meeting with very, very young aspiring engineers and moved from there to meet with retirees um, who, you know, in, in this particular community, um, you know, many of them, or, or, you know, a number of them were still driving, uh, so again, as I mentioned, you know, for, for some, the prospect of uh, moving to self-driving vehicles is daunting because, you know, old habits are hard to break. So that was uh, kind of one uh, perceived <laughs> uh, challenge to overcome. But in, in speaking with the older group, um, we noticed that, you know, as we described, um, you know, what Ollie is today, and that's a 12-person shuttle van that you know, currently has a, a top speed of 30 miles an hour, uh, you know, generally is, is traveling more in the 22 to 24 mile an hour range and being used uh, in kind of self-contained controlled environments like a college campus or an airport. Uh, and so what we noticed is in, in that, over the course of that day in that workshop, um, you know, I, I, it just felt like this audience uh, became more comfortable uh, knowing that a, a new technology like self-driving capabilities was being rolled out in kind of a controlled way rather than uh, hopping in a vehicle and getting out at 65 miles an hour on a highway <laughs> immediately. So uh, that seemed to, to kind of, uh, you know, quell any, any concerns that the group had. But, you know, an important part of having these workshops, including with the AARP group, was to get firsthand feedback from many uh, who include a number of people that rely heavily on public transit. Uh, and so to get their firsthand accounts of what works well and what doesn't work and where, you know, in, in your current experiences of, of public transit and transportation, where could you imagine uh, changes being made that, that could make things a little easier or uh, a little more accessible for you? And so you know, moving ahead from there, uh, we had another um, meeting actually with a, an aging group uh, out in California uh, at the end of February uh, in early March. Uh, you know, myself uh, being, you know, legally blind or visually impaired, uh, I actually headed up a uh, workshop with the visually impaired uh, community here in the Boston area. We've got kind of a rich uh, location here where we've got a number of blindness organizations, including including Perkins School for the Blind, Carroll Center, uh, National Braille Press. Uh, so, I mean, you know, it was a, a really great spot to invite a number of blind and visually impaired people to actually give their firsthand input on, uh, you know, what are your experiences with public transportation and what can be improved to make it more accessible. Uh, so again, moving from there, uh, we had a workshop that was held with a, a deaf and hard of hearing community uh, towards the end of March. Uh, so again, got some firsthand feedback on you know what's working today, what's not working, what what's important for you to include in a vehicle that we're trying to make more accessible to everyone. Uh, and so you know, with the visual impairment, with the aging, with the with the deaf and hard of hearing, I mean, across these workshops, we were getting very, really, really great examples of you know impairment specific. And I'll, I'll use the visual impairment one. Um, you know, I can attest to this personally. Uh, you know, when I get on a, a bus or a train, uh, if the the first seat inside the door is occupied. Uh, as someone who can't see very well, my ability to, to then move further into the vehicle and identify the next open seat uh, is very challenging. So, uh, so you know, kind of that next available seat challenge uh, was kind of a, a use case uh, specific to the blind and visually impaired workshop that emerged. Uh, and so, again, you know, as we continued through these, um, you know, we actually brought – that one use case, that one example of finding an, a, a vacant seat uh, to a hackathon that I actually participated in at MIT uh, in March as well. So, you know, throughout these workshops and as over the courses of these discussions, uh, some very impairment specific um, use cases emerged. Uh, but what we also started to notice was that 
um, you know, there were some common threads. You know, there were some common themes that each group considered to be important and that each group valued or, or emphasized that they'd like to see included in a vehicle that was being specifically um, developed to be highly accessible for everyone. And so, you know, again, some more workshop examples and hackathon examples. I mean, we took part in the Hack Princeton at the end of March, uh, and there are additional uh, hackathons being planned. Uh, so, you know, we, we look to continue this discussion, and such an important element of this process has been to include the actual communities that stand to, you know, have, you know, first off, have the experiences of, of you know, what is needed to make it a, an accessible experience, uh, but also who stand to benefit and, you know, get their firsthand input on uh, making sure that, you know, what we end up with at the end of this process is something that truly is genuinely usable and accessible for everyone. And so, you know, from the workshops and hackathons process, uh, we kind of moved into, um, you know, as I began to describe, you know, identifying what are the use cases that we you know, we, we feel that we should be focusing our time on. Uh, so again, we've got some really great ones. Um, again, some impairment specific, but others that are more broadly uh, applicable across all of the groups that we've met with. Um, you know, some recurring themes that we've heard uh, from, you know, in each of the workshops had to do with uh, things like security, right? Uh, whenever you board a vehicle, uh, regardless of your ability or your impairment or your demographic information, I mean, you know, you want to feel safe and you want to be sure that, you know, riding on that vehicle is, is going to be a safe and, uh, and not harmful experience. And so that was a, a common theme. Also, things like reliability, predictability, like the ability to know uh, when you call for a ride, uh, that it's actually going to show up and, you know, have some idea when it's going to show up. So these kinds of more broadly applicable themes uh, also emerged in addition to kind of the impairment-specific themes that we've been, been seeing. Um, so through this process, uh, because, you know, it is an effort to make a highly accessible self-driving vehicle, uh, we have focused specifically on four kind of target uh, groups to develop our use cases within. Uh, those include visual impairments, cognitive impairments, hearing impairments, and mobility impaired. So, uh, you know, cognitive can be anything from, you know, someone with uh, a language barrier uh, to someone with dyslexia or, you know, anything that uh, uh, could some things like memory. So, um, and the mobility impairment, you know, that kind of uh, gets into kind of the uh, traditional wheelchair ramps, uh, as well as anyone who might be using a cane or a walker. Uh, so again, you know, being sure that if we have these kind of four target, uh, you know, group areas, uh, we want to be sure that we're addressing uh, the needs of, uh, you know, effectively addressing the, need, uh, uh, the needs of each. Uh, also, through the process, we've come up with some, you know, be begun to identify um, you know, some possible solution areas. Uh, and so we're not, you know, again, as you might sense, I mean, this whole process has been very much uh, in the spirit of kind of crowdsourcing, uh, reaching out to the community and inviting feedback and input. So, you know, we're, we're trying not to be very prescriptive, uh, but also, you know, noticing patterns, noticing trends, noticing commonalities in the things that we're hearing from these populations. And so, you know, being mindful of, you know, how we can incorporate and, and you know, what, what kind of possible directions this could be taking us. Uh, and so from there, you know, we've developed specific use cases. Um, you know, the uh, kind of the general heading areas have been arranging for a ride on Ollie, navigating to the vehicle itself, navigating onto the vehicle itself, uh, securing a seat or location uh, on the vehicle once you're aboard, uh, experiencing the ride and being alerted to your destination when you arrive, uh, and arriving at the destination and exiting the vehicle. So for each of those kind of visually impaired, cognitively impaired, hearing impaired, mobility impaired, we've kind of stepped through, uh, you know, all of those scenarios to make sure that, you know, the solutions that we're focusing on as we move to the kind of solution uh, development phase uh, are adequate, adequately addressing all of those needs. And so, you know, this slide here, the next slide that I'm moving to, gives a sense of kind of the use case template that we've been following 
uh, in kind of stepping through that. So, um, you know, you can see that, you know, if if there's a possible technology at our disposal and, you know, through this process, I mean, it's exciting to consider that we have, have basically a, f a full tool belt of available technologies, whether it's augmented reality, whether it's, you know, robots even, um, you know, we, we've got a lot of exciting technologies at our disposal. Uh, and so since we have the use cases defined and the template in place, uh, as we're stepping through, we want to be sure that we're uh, leveraging the most effective, the most optimal possible solutioning uh, as, as we go through the process here. Um, so again, you know, the visual use case was the one um, that uh, that I actually used with uh, with the MIT hack. Um, so again, the arranging for a ride, you know, again, specifically from the perspective of someone who's blind or visually impaired and finding Ollie once Ollie shows up, uh, getting to the vehicle itself, uh, getting aboard and finding a seat. Uh, so again, using that visual example, you can kind of see uh, how we step through the process on this template with each uh, each one of those examples. Okay, uh, so that's kind of where we stand. Again, we're very excited about moving into the kind of solution finding phase of this uh, and also excited about more heavily tapping into the cognitive possibilities and, you know, certainly the, the Watson capabilities uh, that exist. So with that, I'd like to actually ask Will, uh, my colleague Will Scott, to uh, take over and kind of uh, you know, share a little bit about, about the exciting possibilities that uh, that may lie ahead for this project. Sure, thanks a lot, Eric. Um, and I'll uh, you know try to um, keep us on track here to make sure we have time for questions uh, toward the end. Um, but um, you know, as Eric pointed out, uh, we can look to enable a number of use cases uh, using uh, technologies that are already in place, and we can also look toward the future to uh, see how um, autonomous uh, tra uh, autonomous vehicle travel or passengers uh, um, making use of this uh, technology and this form of transportation can be enabled in a more uh, broad sense uh, in their lives, if you will. And we can uh, discuss that in a bit of detail. So as you see off to the right, we discussed an, uh, a number of Watson APIs that are already in use, but how can we use those to uh, address uh, uh, a number of uh, use cases, uh, such as perhaps um, uh, recognition of, uh, you know, a wheelchair or walker, for example, uh, if uh, uh, there is a, a mobility uh, disability. Can we use technology to have visual recognition play a part to um, um, recognize this as the Ollie is uh, uh, approaching? Uh, can we do things like um, uh, incorporate the concept of personalization. Can we have a, uh, a profile for a specific rider that can uh, change or, or, or alter the experience of a, a passenger as they're um, taking advantage of, of Ollie? For blind or low vision um, use cases, can we use haptic feedback uh, to have uh, cues for uh, notifications on destinations or, or help with finding your seat. Uh, all of these uh, technologies that are meant, you know, haptic feedback and visual recognition and, and these things are effectively uh, available in, in all what you could consider point solutions that have to be cohesively, you know, tied together to tackle these, these issues. Uh, for example, you know, uh, the incorporation of a Braille reader uh, or, or Bluetooth integration with uh, communication from the Bluetooth that's interacting with a mobile device, for, for example. But um, how can we take all of this information uh, that's being streamed uh, from the OLLI, uh, this IoT data that's been captured via all of these sensors and, you know, cameras and, and all, you know, this uh, additional uh, context that we're, we're, we're collecting, how can we make use of this in a, uh, a higher level way? Well, the, the key is analytics because, you know, data is, is golden. <laughs> Once you have data, you can begin to model, um, you know, uh, interesting scenarios or even derive interesting insights that may not be immediately recognizable to the naked eye. That with considering 
um, uh, these types of metrics and streaming data that's been collected over passengers over you know thousands of rides, uh, perhaps there could be insights that we could derive. But beyond that, how can we again look to holistically uh, enable or, or benefit the, the passenger? So I'm going to go ahead and skip this slide just to give us time here. I'm going to go right to the end here. Um, what you'll see off to the right is a, uh, it's a, it's a graphic showing uh, effectively multiple facets or areas of life. Um, there's, you know, home life or, or individual could be wearing a, you know, a wearable. Or there's also systems of record that the passenger, if you will, would interact with uh, in terms of, you know, financial institutions or, or, or medical institutions. But how does this all play into uh, the uh, tie into the Ali uh, use case. Well, you know, with the rise of autonomous vehicles, of course, the current use case for uh, or use, usage of Ali is, you know, short range um, travel, you know, low, um, you know, miles per hour in terms of speed. But, you know, you scale this forward, you know, 10 years or so, perhaps the uh, average ride time is much longer. You know, people spend a lot of times in their vehicles. And if this time is not being spent using, you know, you know, driving, perhaps, you know, they're doing other things. And while they're in this vehicle, can we perhaps capture uh, interesting um, um, attributes or, or 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 aspects about that individual that can be fed into a larger solution that um, serves to define a, a, um, a higher level or a holistic view of that individual's well-being. Or, or capabilities. So you'll see here, you know, we have the home life tied in, the time that they're being, um, that they're a passenger on the alley, they're riding, they're having all of these um, various sensors and um, uh, metrics and data points being collected also via the wearable. How, what's their heart rate doing? I didn't mention a, a, a number of various um, uh, uh, data points that be that we can collect via the Ali itself. But once we have all of these various data points, including the time spent in home, the time spent traveling with the wearables, we can aggregate all of this data. We can operate upon it using uh, cognitive approaches and also analytics to uh, determine or, or, or to show rather uh, a more uh, higher level, pic uh, a higher level picture of their capability or their well-being. And with that information, we can look for inflections uh, in well-being. You know, perhaps we can notice when their uh, gait is changing. Uh, they're having difficulty uh, stepping onto the, to the ollie. Or we notice using, um, you know, infrared cameras that their uh, heartbeat, that's one of the technologies that, that's in place right now, their heartbeat is uh, showing um, variations of from one day to another, or a number of things. So the, the takeaway is the uh, pa the travel experience, not not just uh, the the short ride from Ali, can be wrapped into a, a, a larger solution that models the person, and, and this is especially um, a beneficial for an, an aging individual, uh, which would be a a, a huge uh, demographic to leverage this uh, type of technology. So. Uh, again, I, I would like to go into more detail, but I know we're coming to the end of the call here, so um, I will go ahead and uh, pause here, and um, and hopefully we have time for you know a, a question or two. Thank you, Eric, and Will. This is very inspiring, and uh, I wish we had longer to uh, listen to you and to discuss this. Let me just quickly open it up for a question or two. Uh, audience, press star one to ask a question. Yeah, hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, Go sorry, I was wondering about the business aspect of this, and um, it, it's a pretty bold initiative, right, that you've set forth here. Um, it, there's there's a lot of competition in this space, right? Could you uh, comment on that? Um, well, I mean, there's – this is Eric. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, there there is a lot of comp – if – in the space, you're referring to self-driving technology, is that right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, 
Well, uh, you know, I'll, I'll agree with you that there absolutely is a, a fair amount of competition. There's, you know, uh, you know, huge developments every day in, in the capabilities of self-driving technologies. Um, the unique angle, I think, that we're that IBM is bringing to it is the emphasis on accessibility, which you know I personally <laughs> am, am delighted about. Um, you know, and the Watson, including Watson, uh, in uh, so you know IBM is not you know specifically driving kind of the self-driving piece like there are other well you know rep respectable and uh, well-known uh, technology companies that are heavily involved in the self-driving piece. Uh, we're bringing you know specifically like the Watson capabilities and the cognitive piece as well as an emphasis on making sure that it's accessible. So I think that you know really that's a differentiator as well as a, a competitive edge that that we bring to it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other Hi. questions? Yeah, Sue Feldman from the Cognitive Computing Consortium. We're also located in the Boston area, so first of all, I'd like to find out how we can follow up with you. We're developing a framework for cognitive applications uh, with Babson College at this point, um, and huh? this fits right into our research. But secondly, uh, <clears throat> we believe quite strongly that it's the embedded technologies, embedded in various devices which will in some way uh, differentiate um, many applications and make them more successful. So that's what I'm seeing here. It's embedded in Ollie, which is what makes this so unusual. Um, would like to discuss this more if possible and also find out if you're working with some of your partners like WellTalk, for instance, which is a healthcare organization uh, that could easily use this in terms of providing healthcare services. Absolutely, Sue. No, I'd, I'd love to connect. Are you at Benny Street, just out of curiosity? <laughs> no, I'm actually out in Framingham, you know, the desert out oh, wow. here. <laughs> yeah, but, no, yeah, I didn't, I'd invite to you to talk. shoot me. Yeah, yeah no, it, it would be great to connect. I'd love to, you know, hear more about your work and uh, and specifically the Well Talk possibility. But, yeah, I mean, feel free to, uh, you know, let, let's connect after, and I, I, I would yes. look forward to discussion. Okay, you I'll, want I'll to? Make... Yeah, please, I'll Diane. Make... I'll make the introduction. I'll send you Wonderful. both an email introducing you to each other, and you can make um, plans after that. Fabulous. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we're a little past time, but I'd love to keep the conversation going. If um, you can follow up on our LinkedIn discussion group and ask more questions of Will and Eric. And I'd just like to thank Will and Eric for being our presenters today. This is, this is uh, a very exciting area, and congratulations to you both. Um, thank you, audience, for attending, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.